This is the continuation of the topic, the true worship of God. Part two, I'll just do a recap of the things we spoke about in the last episode. We looked at Matthew chapter four, at the temptation of Jesus Christ, how the devil tempted him by taking him onto a high mountain and showing him the glory of the whole world, saying to him, if you bow down and worship me, I will give this all to you. And that is to let us know that one has to be very careful that you know what you worship. It is not everyone that is worshiping that know what they are worshiping or who they are worshiping. Because the devil is also a master in his own capacity. And he will always walk and be against God. And again, he is always trying to imitate that which is original, trying to imitate God, trying to imitate the purpose of God, trying to imitate the person of God himself. And so he seeks and demands worship from man because he also wants to be like God, and to be called a God. So Jesus defeated him by standing on the truth of God's word, which cannot change, which cannot fail. And so you need to be careful. You need to examine who you worship and what you worship. The the human mind is made and created in such a way that it seeks relevance in worship. It seeks comfort and solace in worship. But that must be done in accordance to God's will, in accordance to God's counsel, not according to the will of man. And then we looked again at John chapter 4, where Jesus engaged a woman that he met by the well. And this woman had so much to to raise with Jesus Christ concerning relationship with God. Jesus introduced two main things to her, the living water and the fact that God is a spirit. And everyone that will worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. However, the concern of this woman were many. And out of the so many concerns, let me just reiterate a few. That first of all, she was concerned about where to worship God and who is the true worshiper of God, whether it is the Jews or the Samaritans. She was also concerned about ethnicity. Why would Jesus, being a Jew, speak to her, a Samaritan woman? Why will he ask her for water to drink and she also came up with the issue of where should God be worshipped is it on this mountain or in another mountain okay you Jews say this is Jerusalem is where to worship God so she also spoke about location now one important thing I want us to see in this matter is that in all this one thing Jesus said to her was go and call your husband and she said i'm not married she said i have no husband and jesus said to her you you spoken right you're speaking the truth because the person you are living with now is not your husband you had five husbands and this one that you're living with is not your husband jesus in all this did not condemn the woman he did not say unto her because you are a prostitute you cannot worship God. He did not say to her, because you are not married, because you have been living with different men, I cannot even teach you what is right concerning worship. And so Jesus said to her, all these things are not what matters. They will become a source for concern, not now, but after something has happened to you. You need to address your lifestyle. And that is that the need 
to worship God in spirit and in truth. And this is where I want to pick up today, looking at the things that matter to us, the things that we think matter a lot to us as religious people, as worshippers, as people that love to worship God, thinking we are having a true worship or we are worshipping a true God. The number one thing I will want to talk about here is that be mindful of this very fact that being religious does not make you a true worshipper of God. There are various religions in the world. And so being a religious person does not make you a true worshipper of God until you identify and discover what is the way and how you need and ought to worship God. And again, more, very important as well, is who is the God that you worship? And so in our world today, we put a lot of emphasis on dedication to service, that is, attending places of religious worship, going into, uh, into, into religious homes to do the rites. The fact that a man is fully committed and dedicated to a particular sect or particular religion does not mean he or she is worshipping in truth and in spirit or that he or she is performing a true worship. As a matter of fact, it could be that this person we are looking at is using her engagement or his engagement as a means of escaping from deep inner fears, fears that he or she entertains, or it could be as a means of escape from certain concerns, that worries that you're going through in life, or to overcome your feelings, or it could be a means of escape from certain failures that you know you have failed in certain things and you have no way, you don't know what to do, and the, probably the only place where you think something can happen to you is by being in the place of worship. And so worship now becomes an escape route from the troubles, the traumas, and the pains of the world. Yeah, it works. But that does not guarantee that you worship the living God or that your worship is true and sincere. Again, we need to be mindful of the fact that true worship is not about keeping religious rites, such as washing. Some believe until they really have their bath, they can worship God. Or until they wash certain parts of the body, they can worship God. And for some, when they go through certain phase of nature in, in their life, they are bad from worshiping God. That does not guarantee a true worship. The external factors, the things we pay attention to, does not guarantee a true worship. Neither is dressing. Dressing to look pious, dressing to look holy, dressing in a certain way because this is the way God wants us to dress and approach Him, does not guarantee a true worship. Abstinence from certain food, from certain food, this is what I should eat. This is what I cannot eat because this is what pleases God. It does not guarantee true worship. Recitation of the scriptures and or religious creeds does not guarantee true worship. Neither is singing guaranteed true worship. Because sometimes we think we work, the true worship of God is when we sing. And there are debates even in certain circles that when you sing slow songs, that is when you are worshipping God. No, it's not so. Neither is it also about speaking in tongues. Some also believe the true worship of God is when you speak in tongues or in an unknown tongue. No, it does not guarantee true worship. Even though some of these things are needful, they are necessary, but that or they cannot form the basis for true worship, or the foundation for true worship. Now let's look at 
a few scriptures together again and see what God is saying. In Genesis chapter 22, from verse 1 to 5, we see God instructing Abraham to take his only son to offer him as a sacrifice. In verse 3, the scripture says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Now looking at this scripture, we we'll want to focus on a few things there. One is that the place where Abraham was supposed to worship was a place instructed by God. Not a place that Abraham decided or chose for himself. It was instructed by God. And in going there, he took two of his servants along with him to, to help saddle his ass with his son and the materials that he would use for the sacrifice. Now, when he got to a place where he could see the place of worship, where he would worship God afar off, he asked those who were with him to stay back, and he will go with the son. Now, what are we seeing here is to know that the worship of God is not a collective thing, even though there are times that worship can be collective, but the primary the primary assignment in worshiping God as an individual is for you to have a connection with the God that you worship, with the Almighty God, the one that instructs how and where to worship him and how to worship him. So we see Abraham taking up the act of worshiping God by going alone and not just alone he took along the object or what he would use as a means of worshiping god which was his son that he was meant to sacrifice and so the other thing we are lo- we are looking at here is that worship of god that true worship of god involves sacrifice It involves a sacrifice. And that was what Abraham was ready to do, to sacrifice his child. And so where we are not ready to sacrifice, we cannot be talking of true worship. The true worship of God is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of our life. It's a sacrifice of everything we we have without laying down, without giving up our own selves, we cannot be said to be worshipping God in truth and in spirit. We look again at another scripture, which is Luke in chapter 18, reading from verse 9. We see the example of two men who went to the temple to worship. I read, And he spoke this parable, unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 13. And the publican, standing afar off, will not lift up so much 
as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. And what are we looking at here? We are seeing true worship as a way of humbling ourselves before God. Let's look at this, the, the case of the Pharisee again. He was righteous. That means he was a pious man. He was a man that observed all the rules and regulations of the religion that he practiced. And so within himself, he was satisfied. He was satisfied with himself. He was satisfied that he was worshiping God. But now on getting to the temple to pray, he, he did not satisfy God. And so until your worship is acceptable to God, it does not become a true worship. No matter how much of religious coloration it has in it, no matter how much religious you try to make it to be, no matter how good you try to make it to be, as long as it involves you as the person at the center stage, presenting yourself to God as you think you should or as you feel you should, something is missing. Something is missing. Look at the case of the Republican. He came and hit his chest and said, Lord, who am I? I am nothing. I have no part to play in this. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Now that does not also mean that everyone that says I'm a sinner is a true worshiper. We will dig a little deeper into that in the next episode. But this man looked at himself and could not find any point or any reason to stand before God and boast. What do you take pride in? Do you take pride in the fact that the Almighty God is your God or in the fact that you are a worshiper? You are a worshiper and so everybody must respect you because you are who you say you are. What, pl what place does pride play in your religious activity? What role does pride play in your worship of God? If your worship is boosted with pride, there is no true worship. If your worship is based on the external appearance, how you appear, how you look, the washings you do, the dress you put on, the fastings you do. And so you can say, oh, for me, I fast seven times a, a, a month, or I fast 90 days in a year. If that is what you base your worship on, you may be far from worshiping God. It is not fasting that makes one a worshiper, even though it is, it is essential. It's, a, it's absolutely essential to fast as a Christian. Not because of length, or because the church has declared a fast, but because you know the essence of fasting. And so I urge you this day to look into your life and ask yourself the question, is my worship true? Is my worship sincere? Am I engaged in a true worship of God? Who is, is this God? Is it a true God I'm worshipping or a demon? Is it a true God I'm worshipping or a manifestation of the true God? Some people base their worship of God on manifestations of seeing miracles and things happening around them that they cannot imagine can happen. That's what makes them to be a worshipper. That's what makes them to worship. No, you may be wrong. But I will tell you in the next episode what it is, what it takes to be a true worshiper and who is the God that must be worshipped. 
My prayer this day is that the Almighty God will grant you the spirit of humility to be able to examine your heart, to be able to examine your life in reality and find out from, from within, what do I want in life? Do I want to serve God or serve man? Do I want to serve an institution or serve myself? Or do I really want to serve the true God? That's my prayer for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.